Why don't you just yeah. jump in and swim around and yeah. don't worry about the mask? Would you like that, sweetie? Mm -hmm. Just to yeah. come just to come relax or do you want just some I yeah. want to, to roll back. Okay. I need a nap. A nap? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to come up? <laughs> yes, also, my love. Yes, okay, my love. Sweetie, you can I have a high five? On my last visit to Australia, I toyed with going to the Great Barrier Reef. I knew it was in poor health, but I told myself that it was too far, that I was too busy and needed by my family back home. It's a giant clam. A giant clam? A giant clam. And this is a camouflage seahorse. Can you see that? Camouflage. That was September of 2015. It wasn't long after that the news came. The extreme bleaching event is likely to kill some of the world's most pristine coral. A mass bleaching sweeping across reefs around the world like an angel of death. Turning what had been a riot of life into a ghostly bone white forest. Including, of course, the Great Barrier Reef. Even some of the reef's most pristine parts were bleached, the ones protected from local pollution, but not the global kind. More than 90% of the reef was impacted by bleaching. Bleached coral can recover, especially if we keep temperatures from spiking. But nearly a quarter of the reef wasn't just bleached, it was dead, covered in the rank brown goo of decaying life. It was as if a cosmic switch had been flipped and suddenly one of the most beautiful places on Earth had turned into one of its ugliest. The regret I felt was for all of us, for all that we have lost and all that we will lose to the climate crisis. But the loss was also intensely personal. It was about my son. I'm lucky enough to have spent long stretches of my childhood communing with life on other reefs, from Southern California to Greece. My father is a passionate scuba diver, and he had me snorkeling by age six. I developed a reputation in my family for spotting lost treasures on the ocean floor. Mostly what I loved to do was float in the shallows over a vibrant reef, staying as still as I could manage, until the fish forgot about their human intruder and swam right up to my mask, even nibbled on a limb. Is there another experience that puts humans in more direct contact with such density of wild creatures? Not that I've ever known. At four years old, our son is too young to really snorkel. He learned to swim less than a year ago and has a technique we fondly describe as thrashing about in circles. By the time he's a strong enough swimmer to focus on more than staying afloat, who knows what will be left for him to see. All right, Toma, uh, welcome big, aboard. Big, big, big I told Toma that some of the coral we'll see is going to be really healthy and that coral get, can get sick too, right? So we'll see some coral that's not so healthy, that maybe it has like a little fever. Yep, and there's okay. all everywhere. And uh, will you help the coral? Yes, we're trying to help the coral. The reef is still worth saving. I mean, it's, we'll go out there and the people that are, this is their first time go, wow, this is fantastic. They just don't know what it used to be like. Yeah. Uh, 40 years ago, this was, you know, there was 80% more fish and there was more coral. It was just so vibrant. But I still wanted to bring him with me to the Great Barrier Reef. Not to scare him, anything but that. But just in case, amidst the coral that is still alive, he can find something beautiful to connect with. Something he can carry with him as he navigates life on a warmer, harsher planet than the one I grew up on. 
because climate change is already here and kids are on the front lines. Climate change is here for kids in Haiti whose homes were demolished in Hurricane Matthew. It's here for the infants being born with brain abnormalities from Rio to Miami because warmer weather often means longer seasons for Zika-carrying mosquitoes. It's here for the babies and toddlers crammed onto leaky boats as their families flee conflicts that we know were exacerbated by historic drought. Most of the time, climate change is hard to pry apart from all the other crises rocking our world. Poverty, racism, militarism, they get all mixed up. But here, on the reef, it feels really simple. This world-changing event is mostly just about warming. Water just one or two degrees too hot swept through this region last year, and coral life could not survive the stress. Threatening not just the fish that depend on the reef, but the ancient indigenous cultures that depend on the fish. In 2015, the Australian government was still insisting that the reef would be okay, even aggressively lobbying against its World Heritage Site status being classified as in danger. The global umpire has declared unanimously that not only is the reef not in danger, but that it should be taken off the watch list. It's not on anybody's watch list. Then, in just one year, it was already over in large parts of the reef. It's a reminder that though climate change is a slow-moving crisis, there are junctures when it suddenly speeds up. Indeed, when it leaps. There is shame in all this. As parents, we are vested with one overarching duty, to protect and safeguard the future for our kids. And we are failing at it. Not just parents, all of us. When I contemplate what my son will never experience of our collective natural heritage, it's not just loss and grief that I feel, it's also rage. <laughs> Rage at the handful of fossil fuel majors, their earnings more than the GDPs of so many nation states who knew about climate change back in the 70s, yet wasted decades muddying the waters with misinformation and manufactured doubt. All while they blocked our progress towards renewables and opened up vast new pools of carbon. Rage at the governments that took their money and gave out the drilling permits, and who are still doing it, back home in my country and in Australia as well. Calls to stop liquefied natural gas developments along the Queensland coast have intensified. It's almost unfathomable, but here in Queensland, plans are hurtling ahead to dig one of the world's largest coal mines, along with a massively expanded port. To make way for all the coal barges, the seabed will have to be dredged, scraping away crucial habitat for already vulnerable marine mammals. And this mega project is planned for just 19 kilometers away from the already bleached and fragile Great Barrier Reef. Are we mad? I often hear that climate change is too abstract or too remote for us to focus on with all the other crises screaming for our attention. But there's nothing remote or abstract about the mass die-off under these waves. And underneath our own placid surfaces, beneath our fractured attention spans and claims of indifference, there is, I think, more going on than we like to admit. There is grief at what we're losing, and there's rage at the perpetrators, including at ourselves. And there is a deep desire to protect the people and the places we love. That's why I wanted to come to the reef, to feel the power that it still holds, even in its wounded state. It's why I wanted to be here with my son, who sees only the beauty and has no idea what has already been stolen from him and his generation. And that's as it should be, for now.